Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this MPTL course entitled 20th Century Fiction where we're looking at Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. So today will be have the penultimate lecture uh, for this particular text, so the second last lecture. Uh, and we just wind up with some of the um, uh, issues which we have dealt with and discussed already. Now, one thing which keeps coming up, a recurring motive, a recurring issue in Heart of Darkness is the entire politics of narration. And we see how uh, Marlowe in Heart of Darkness is a nervous narrator, is almost neurotic in quality and a story that he wants to convey to the European uh, listeners, European interlocutors in times is uh, something which happened to him in Congo and doesn't quite have the narrative machinery, uh, narrative apparatus uh, so to say, to convey the sensation, to convey what really happened to him. So among other things, Heart of Darkness is the uh, crisis uh, in terms of the translation uh, from an experience into a narrative. So that translation does not quite take place in Heart of Darkness and Marlowe is quite aware of his in own inadequacy as a narrator, of his own absurdity as a narrator and you know, this section that we look at now, uh, we'll find how he acknowledges his absurdity, acknowledges his inadequacy at the same time he expresses his frustration as a very inadequate narrator and this should be on your screen where he says, absurd, he cried. This is the worst of trying to tell. Here you all are, each moored with two good addresses, like a hulk with two anchors, a butcher round one corner, a policeman round another, excellent appetites and temperament, temperature normal. You hear normal from years end to years end, and you say absurd. Absurd be exploded, absurd. My dear boys, what can you expect from a man who out of sheer nervousness had just flung overboard a pair of new shoes? So he's saying that, you know, it's very easy for you to judge morally, it's very easy for you to judge intellectually. Uh, the story that I'm telling you is absurd. But what can you expect from a man who sheer, out of sheer nervousness you know, flung a pair of shoes uh, overboard because you know, he was so nervous, he was so unfamiliar with the surrounding around him. And if you remember the last lecture, we, we looked at the entire politics of delayed decoding, the entire politics of defamiliarization wherein uh, the environment around Marlowe, the, the surroundings around Marlowe, they change dramatically and drastically and he doesn't quite know how to navigate uh, you know, with the environment around him. And so what happens in that kind of condition is a crisis in embodiment. And by embodiment, I mean the neural as well as the discursive negotiation with the surrounding. That's the working definition of embodiment and how to darkness. It's a discursive uh, maneuver that you're, you're maneuvering with the discursive apparatus around you. That includes language, that includes politics, that includes culture, all these very discursive things. But at the same time, there's also a very embedded neural quality about embodiment. It's how you neurally navigate with the surroundings. So it has an embedded quality as well as an extended quality, right? So the extended quality is a discursive quality. The embedded quality is a neural quality. And it's a combination of both these qualities which inform uh, embodiment in the first place. So in a, in a way, it, this can be seen uh, among other things as a crisis in embodiment, out of darkness, right? And that obviously is part of the crisis in storytelling. That's part of the, you know, the entire package of storytelling. Because storytelling too is a form of embodiment. You're putting your experience into language, you're putting experience into a narrative and that too becomes an extended performance of your experience and that you know, doesn't quite take place, doesn't quite take off, doesn't quite become a smoothless and seamless affair in Heart of Darkness. Okay, uh, so we see over here uh, an interesting section is coming up and I'm just going to spend a little bit of time uh, examining and unpacking this section. Uh, and this is about Kurtz's intended, right? So Kurtz essentially has, two, there are two female figures, you know, around Kurtz and Heart of Darkness. One is a European intended, someone who uh, he was he promised to marry, uh, the fiancé who lives in Brussels, the European woman, the naive European woman, the naive consumer uh, of imperialism, so to say. And he also has a mistress who is African. And again, if you look at the very, very racist, uh, and racially uh, focalized description of these two female figures. So Kurtz's intended is a very elegant Mona. Kurtz's intended is described as someone who's very elegant and feminine uh, in a very beautiful, uh, almost non-bodily way, right? Whereas the mistress who's African is exoticized and uh, is almost visceralized. I don't quite know that such a word exists, but it's all about the body. 
uh, and so the body quality, the embodied quality uh, of the, the mistress, the African mistress is highlighted and is foregrounded, is dramatized over and over again. Uh, and that becomes part of the exotic package, that, that becomes part of the exotic narrative which is invested into that description. Whereas with the intended who is European, who is white, uh, you know, the, the main markers are the markers of elegance, the markers of mourning, the markers of you know, non-embodied, non-sexual, uh, you know, kind of descriptions, whereas the, the, the African mistress is obviously hypersexualized and hyper-embodied in the description that Malu offers us. And that sort of betrays, in a way, uh, the white uh, focal point in Heart of Darkness. The entire story is told from a very white focal point. I mean, albeit a, a neurotic, albeit a nervous, albeit an unreliable focal point, but it's still very, very white and male and privileged. And that white male privilege, uh, that, that is very much part of the, uh, the focalization in Heart of Darkness. The entire story is told to that particular focus point, which is what we have to bear in mind all the time. Okay, uh, so, you know, and this is a reference to the intent. My intended, you would have perceived directly then how completely she was out of it. And the lofty frontal bone of Mr. Kurt. So again, we saw how the physiognomy markers, uh, you know, which were supposedly reflective of degeneration, criminality, etc., were rampant uh, in 19th century. It's very much there in Heart of Darkness. If you remember the earlier scene when Malu is about to set off from Europe, uh, he meets a doctor, and we, we had read the scene quite extensively, but it's worth uh, reiterating it. Uh, how uh, the doctor had talked about the frontal bone uh, uh, and how that becomes a mark of degeneration, insanity, uh, criminality, etc. They say the hair grows on uh, growing sometimes, the hair goes on growing sometimes, but this old specimen was impressively bald. The wildness had patted him on the head, and behold, it was like a ball, an ivory ball. It had caressed him, and lo, he had withered. It had taken him, loved him, embraced him got into his veins, consumed his flesh and sealed his soul to his own by the very inconceivable ceremonies of some devilish initiation. So again, if you look at the adjective devilish initiation, so the entire African setting is described as devilish over here, uh, which is to say anti-Christian, anti-white, anti-European, anti-civilization. But, uh, and that's a, a very, very racist kind of rhetoric, which is uh, a racially inflected rhetoric that is used by Marlowe and by extension by Conrad over here. But what is interesting for us to understand is how the entire experience of imperialism becomes a consuming experience, it consumes goods. Um, there is a quasi-cannibalistic quality about his experience. It, it sort of eats him up in a way. Uh, it takes away his body, it, it just converts his body into something else, his head becomes bold and he becomes ivory. And this is a very symbolic transition, a very symbolic morphing. So the, whole, uh, the body of Kurtz you know, morphing into ivory becomes a very symbolic shift. So in a way, he becomes imperialism. So he completely overappropriates imperialism. And, and this is part of the problem with Kurtz. The reason why he becomes a problem uh, for the imperial machinery is not because he's an inadequate uh, soldier, not because he's an inadequate imperialist, it's because he's a hyper-adequate imperialist. He does it too much, he over-appropriates imperialism. And therein lies this monstrosity, that it becomes too perfect, it becomes uh, too appropriate, you know, it becomes too much of an imperial specimen. Uh, so he becomes the ivory in a way, and that's a very symbolic morphing, a very symbolic becoming, a very symbolic performative process through which it becomes the ivory, which obviously is a signifier of imperialism over here. So that ivory ball, Kurtz looking like an ivory ball is a very symbolic kind of definition and something which we must bear in mind in terms of the categorization of Kurtz, how is categorized. Okay, so he was a spoiled and pampered favorite. So there's this prodigal son narrative about Kurtz as well. So he's a son who goes prodigal, uh, he, he's a son who goes haywire, he's a son who goes, you know, becomes monstrous. And the monstrosity of Kurtz is part of the hyper-appropriation, the fact that he's hyper-appropriated the colonial uh, specimens, the colonial markers, the imperial markers. And therein lies a the problem, therein lies a the monstrosity, therein lies the uh, entire cannibalistic quality about Kurtz. So the whole idea of being a spoiled son, the pampered son, the prodigal son of imperialism, it becomes a, a, a departure from a Christian narrative, right? Ivory. I should think so, heaps of it, stacks of it, the old mud shanty was bursting with it. So again, an overabundance of ivory and a hyper visibility of the imperials in the fire and that becomes a problem for imperialism. So there's no, it's very naked, it's very, very explicit. It is nothing at all which is even trying to efface the greed, the exploitation, the lust for power, the lust for uh, imperial machinery over here. It's very much foregrounded, it's very much in your face and that becomes a problem. So again, just to repeat myself, uh, the problem with Kurtz, the monstrosity of Kurtz 
lies in this hyper appropriation of imperialism, lies in this hyper appropriation of the imperial signifier of ivory. And this very symbolic shift into ivory, the fact that it becomes ivory, is very, very symbolic of that hyper appropriation. That it, it lets go of his human qualities, he faces, he hollows out as a human being, and it becomes the ivory, it becomes the material, uh, the material marker for imperialism in this particular case. Okay, you'd think there was not a single tusk left either above or below and ground in the whole country. Right, so everything uh, uh, around Kurds had been taken over, everything had been appropriated. Okay, and now the next section uh, that I want to spend some time with today, uh, time on today, is when Kurds becomes his possessor, he becomes this sort of autocratic possessor, the, the proprietor of everything around him. Uh, so the sense of ownership that he has, and not just on material things, but also on uh, human beings, right? And what this does on a very symbolic macro level is, among other things, Heart of Darkness 2 is an example of the horrors that come with hyper-reification or hyper-commodification, right? And that's something that I'm going to spend some time with today. What is hyper-commodification? What is hyper-reification? So, reification or commodification is a process through which an object becomes a commodity, right? In other words, an object becomes something which can be sold and purchased and comes to a price tag. It enters the, uh, you know, purchase, consume economy, right? Or purchase and sell economy. Uh, so that, that, that transition from an object into a commodity, the transition from being uh, a natural object into an economic object is the, what the process of commodification or reification is all about. Now, Heart of Darkness, in a sense, is about hyper-reification, where everything becomes more than a commodity. It just everything literally becomes a commodity, from ivory uh, to the land, uh, to the territory, to human beings. So every object, every human being, every entity becomes a commodity in Heart of Darkness. And that becomes a problem. Right? So the problem in Heart of Darkness is that it shows or foregrounds the excesses of imperialism, right? And that becomes part of the crisis of Heart of Darkness. The crisis comes from excess. And the same thing happens in Mother's story because there's so much to tell, there's so much to put in, there's so much to pack in into the narrative that doesn't quite know how to navigate with it. It doesn't quite know how to structure it, it doesn't quite know how to put that into a, a sequence or a linearity. And therein lies the crisis in narration Heart of Darkness. So there too, there's a problem of excess, right? So the unreliability, the inadequacy in Heart of Darkness, they all stem from a sense of excess. Okay, so we can see now Kurtz, he goes on marking everything as his territory, marking everything as his property, as his commodity. So my ivory, oh yes, I heard him, my intended, my ivory, my station, my river, my, everything belonged to him. So this entire uh, territorialization, this entire ownership, uh, this absolute ownership on everything around him, so that makes Kurtz into a monster, that makes Kurtz into some kind of imperial monster, right? So. Again, uh, as I just mentioned, the problem with Kurtz is this hyper-appropriation of the colonial imperial narrative that everything must be done clinically, mercilessly uh, and absolutely, right? So there's no human element left at all. So he almost becomes like an imperial zombie, uh, an imperial Frankenstein and monster, which goes too perfect, which goes too sublime to the point of monstrosity, right? So you know, if you remember Frankenstein, uh, the monstrosity uh, in that story is about a sublimity. It is so sublime, it is so superhuman. Uh, therein lies the monstrosity, and, and the same happens with Kurtz over here as well. Okay, so you know, my ivory, my station, my intended, my river, everything belongs to him, uh, and that's something which is uh, you know the hyper commodification, the hyper appropriation, uh, you know, is something that is part of the horror in Heart of Darkness. And, and, and interestingly and appropriately enough, the final words of Kurtz is the horror, the horror, right? So you know, again, the whole idea of the horror uh, becomes uh, part of the and the entire existential. Uh, problem in Heart of Darkness, that everything is consumed, everything is sort of cannibalistic in quality. Okay, and then of course Marlowe comes back to his cynical self, uh, where he sort of almost condescendingly looking at his listeners and say, well, how can you understand this horror? Because you are so secured in a European establishment, you are so secured in your lovely little neighborhoods. And um, this is what he says, how could you? with solid pavements under your feet, surrounded by kind neighbors ready to cheer you or fall on you, stepping delicately between the butcher and the policeman in a holy terror of scandal and gallows and lunatic asylums, how can you imagine what particular region or the first ages a man's untrammeled feet may take him into by the way of solitude, utter solitude without a policeman, by the way of silence, utter silence, where no warning voice of a kind neighbor can be heard whispering a public opinion. 
So the entire question of silence becomes uh, interesting over here because what silence is obviously is a whole uh, it is almost giving you a diagram of defamiliarization. Everything is defamiliarized and therein lies a silence. The silence stems from an inscrutability, the unknowability in how the darkness. You can't know anything. You can't find out. You can't navigate your way uh, into knowledge. Right, so the entire navigation with knowledge that, that is interrupted almost permanently in heart of darkness. Right, and therein lies the problem, therein lies the inscrutability, therein lies the silence, therein lies the horror of the silence uh, over here. So, Malu is being very cynical and condescending uh, and so sort of looking down upon us European listeners is how could you possibly imagine or uh, grasp this knowledge or grasp this idea because you know you can't, you can't possibly think or envisage a situation where everything around you is unfamiliar, defamiliarized and inscrutable and all you have is a silence. Now the next section uh, um, is I am going to spend some time with today is the construct of goods. What is goods? Who is goods? How do they come into being? What is the background of goods? Uh, because you know there is hardly any categorization done on goods. We only see goods to the effect produced by him. Right, so in that sense, there's a spectrality about this categorization. It's almost like a ghostly spectral quality which informs this categorization. Now, who is he? Where did he come from? Uh, so, his mother was half English, and this should be on the screen. His mother was half English, his father was half French. All Europe contributed to the making of goods. Okay, so you know, this is a very, very symbolic description. Mother was uh, half English, father was half French. Uh, in a half English, half French, and all Europe combining together. So, goods becomes the European man, the symbolic European man, the symbolic imperial European man who is sent to the empire, you know, sent by the French, by the English. So, he is the entire European imperialism put together. So, he in a way becomes the embodiment of European imperialism, and in that sense, he is also the symptom. Uh, the pathological symptom of European imperialism, what happens uh, with the excesses of European imperialism and that is something which uh, you know, Kurtz embodies uh, you know, to a large extent. Okay. Now, the, the other section that I am going to spend some time with, a little, little phrase over here which is important for us is a report that Kurtz had written about the suppression of savages in the Congo which is a report he was supposed to submit. And what was the report that Kurtz had written is just one little sentence or even just not a sentence, a half a sentence, a phrase perhaps. And what was it? Exterminate all the brutes, right. So, exterminate, kill everyone, uh, kill all the brutes, kill all the brutes. Now, the whole idea of the brutes is important over here. So, what does brutes, what, what does Kurtz mean by brutes? So, does he mean uh, the normal racial or uh, racist understanding of brutes as Africans, kill all the Africans, make a genocide? kill away all the Africans or is it more complicated than that? Is it more metaphorical than that? Is it talking about the brutes as in the barbarity which comes out of European imperialism, the barbarity which comes out of the white European imperialism. So, that is the ambivalence in how the darkness, that is the ambivalence in the report over here. Uh, it is not quite clear. The literal reading of it will be to kill away all the Africans, take away the territory, take away the ivory, take away the water, take away all the resources by exterminating all the brutes. That is the racist uh, hyper imperial understanding of uh, the, the message away up. The more metaphoric message, the more problematic and perhaps self reflexive message would be you know, exterminate all the brutality inside you. So, both readings are equally valid and you quite know which one to go with, and therein lies the ambivalence in how to darkness. Okay. And now we, uh, we, we come with the end of Kurtz, we come to the point where Kurtz's end comes and it, again the whole idea of Kurtz is dying, the whole uh, process, the whole description of Kurtz's dying is done in a very spectral way, right. So, it is very shadowy, it is very spectral, we do not quite know how he dies, we just know that he is decaying away, he embodies decadence which stems out of excess, which emerges out of excess. Uh, so, it is a decadence imperialism which is coming out of a pathological excess, it is almost like a medical problem. Right, uh, and therein lies the decadence, therein lies the, uh, the death of Kurtz. So, it is a very symbolic kind of a death as well. Okay, so next we come to the point where you know, following Kurtz's death or the entire ceremony around Kurtz's death, we see for the first time a very spectral figure of Kurtz's, uh, you know, the African mistress, the African woman, uh, who obviously is not given a voice. And that is a very symbolic absence as well, the absence of a voice. No African speaks in Heart of Darkness. The entire story is told from a white male perspective which obviously makes it very racially problematic. But at the same time, we are also aware that uh, looking at Heart of Darkness today, the reason why it is relevant today is precisely because of its political incorrectness. Right? And uh, in that sense, a very honest novel about imperialism. It does not try to be politically correct, does not give voices to people who did not have voices historically at that point of time. Okay. So, uh, 
And then we have the figure of the woman coming in, and this should be on a screen. Dark human shapes could be made out in the distance, flitting um, indistinctly against the gloomy border of the forest. And near the river, two bronze figures, leaning on tall spears, stood in the sunlight under fantastic headdresses of spotted skins, warlike and still in statistical repairs. And from right to left along the lighted shore moved a wild and gorgeous apparition of a woman. So again, look at the adjectives over here, wild and gorgeous. So again, it's wild as an exotic, gorgeous as an hypersexualized apparition of a woman. And the word apparition is interesting because she's not really a uh, human being with flesh and blood. She's more of a spectral figure, an exotic, uh, hypersexualized spectra. And that, that hypersexuality, that, you know, the spectrality is something which is very much part of the categorization of the African woman over here. Because remember, the African woman is doubly marginalized, uh, A, racially, and B, uh, in terms of her sexuality, in terms of her gender location. And therein lies the, political, uh, the, the politically problematic categorization and how the darkness. But take a look at how the woman appears now. She walked with measured steps, draped in striped and fringe clothes, treading the earth proudly with a slight jingle and flash of barbarous ornaments. Again, barbarous ornaments. Again, these are like anti-civilization, markers of anti-civilization. She carried her head high. Her hair was done in the shape of a helmet. She had brass leggings to the knee, brass wire gauntlets to the elbow, a crimson spot on her tawny cheek, innumerable necklaces of glass baits on her neck, bizarre things, charms, gifts of witch men, the hung about her, glitter and tremble at every step. So again, everything belongs to witch men. There's something uh, wizardry happening over here. There's something dark magical uh, or darkly magical about appearance, which is obviously very, very exoticized. And, uh, you know, the whole idea is uh, to essentialize the, the African woman over here, essentialized through sexual markers, racial markers, uh, bodily markers, etc. And everything that she's wearing uh, become pointers to some kind of a dark magic, some kind of an evil magic uh, you know, that mother doesn't quite know. Right, so the whole idea of uh, not knowing becomes immediately dark in heart of darkness, right? So uh, darkness over here becomes a mark of ignorance, marker of mystery over here. And the whole idea of mystery, magic, darkness, uh, they're obviously politically constructed uh, from a European male perspective. And that, that's something which we must bear in mind all the time. Okay, and then look at the description over here, look at the adjectives. She was savage and superb, wild-eyed and magnificent. There was something ominous and stately in uh, and the deliberate progress and the hush that had fallen suddenly upon the whole sorrowful land, the immense wilderness, the colossal body of the fecund and mysterious life seemed to look at her, pensive, as though it had been looking at the image of his own tenebrous and passionate soul. So savage and superb, and there's something magical, there's something savage about her. So, you know, both the adjectives and all the adjectives over here, actually, are adjectives of excess, uh, or hyperabundance, overabundance. And uh, it's beyond something, it's beyond the European reason, it's beyond the European logic, it's beyond the rational frame. And in that sense, uh, the categorization, the uh, description of the, uh, the mistress, the African mistress in Heart of Darkness, is very politically problematic because, you know, this has been looked at from a white male perspective. Uh, the entire lens is very white, very male, uh, and therein lies the hypersexualized, mysterious, cryptic characterization of Kutz's in a, in a mistress over here. And if you take a look at the end of Heart of Darkness, which you will in the next lecture, if you contrast this description uh, of this African woman with the intended, the white European intended, the white European fiancé, who is overdressed uh, in the clothes of a Mona, and all the markers in her uh, appearance are elegant markers, the markers of elegance, the markers of mourning, the markers of magnificence. There's nothing savage about her, there's nothing uh, wild about her, there's nothing magical about her. But when it comes to uh, Kutz's mistress, African mistress, it's, it's wild, it's magical, it's savage, right? And all that in form come together, or put together to create a sense of excess, to create a sense of almost mysterious, cryptic characterization, which you don't quite know, and everything has been talked about and described through a very white male lens. Okay, so, uh, and of course we know that you know, no one speaks in Heart of Darkness, uh, no non-white person speaks in Heart of Darkness, uh, except this one uh, cry, this one shout, this one wail uh, that, uh, you know, this, of course, this, uh, white, this African mistress does. And this is something that's described away here in some details. Suddenly she opened her bare arms and threw them up rigid above her head, as though in an uncontrollable desire to touch the sky. And at the same time, the swift shadows darted out of the earth. 
swept round on the river, gathering the streamer into a shadowy embrace. A formidable silence hung over the scene. So even look at the atmospheric description, look at the mysterious description, something brooding, something ghostly, something spectral about the entire movement uh, in this particular woman. She turned away slowly, walked on following the bank and passed into the bushes to the left. Only once her eyes gleamed back at us in the dusk of the thickets before she disappeared. Right? So this is the entire description in Heart of Darkness about the uh, female figure. The only African, the only non-white person who gets some description in Heart of Darkness uh, is someone in the Kutsu's intended, a uh, Kutsu's um, uh, African mistress who comes uh, and embodies this mystery that is Africa, embodies the atmospheric quality around Marlowe that it doesn't quite navigate, doesn't quite know, and she embodies the defemorization the mysterious, exotic defemorization uh, and the, the entire characterization, the entire uh, figure, the entire, uh, you know, package that is given over here uh, around this particular figure, particular character is that of excess, is that of uh, abundance, uh, hyperabundance, is that of magic, is that of darkness, right? So these are the markers that are used uh, to describe her and, and obviously these are politically problematic, these are uh, sexually problematic, you know, gendered wise. Uh, she's sort of essentialized as this excessive African woman uh, who is uh, part of nature. So this entire connection with nature, the, the abundance of nature, the endlessness of nature, the mystery of nature. Is something which is embodied by the Kutsu's uh, African mistress over here, uh, compared to which uh, the white mistress, the white intended, the white fiance in Brussels is a perfectly domestic and docile white woman who's an elegant mourner. So the two female figures in Heart of Darkness are very symbolically, uh, you know, they represent two different kinds of culture, two different kinds of uh, in a perspective, uh, both are looked at by the white male, but you know, one is domestic and docile and knowable, and other is non domestic, wild, savage, and splendid and magical. And you know, that's something which we must bear in mind when we look at the characterization in How to Darkness. So, we we'll stop at this point today, and the next lecture we'll wind up with the text and we'll look at the ending in How to Darkness, which is quite symbolic and existential as well, which is something which we'll cover in the final lecture in the next session. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.